All right, let's kick things off promptly. These are the worst 139 cards in Magic history in no particular order, although they will get worse and worse as the video goes on. Stick around to the end for the absolute worst of them. Bad PT for CMC. These creatures have low power and toughness relative to their mana cost. Coming in at number 139, we have Avon Trooper, which costs 4 mana for a 1-1 flyer. But don't fret, you can pay 3 mana and discard a card to give it plus 1 plus 2. At numbers 138 to 137, we have Bog Hoodlums and Dripping Dead. These are both 6 mana 4 ones that can't block. Bog Hoodlums clashes on ETB to get a plus 1 counter, so there's a chance it'll actually be a 5-2. Dripping Dead has a pseudo death touch ability. Either way, they're both quite expensive for two creatures that can't attack well or block at all. At number 136, we have Chimney Imp, a 5 mana 1 2 flyer. Don't worry though, it also has when it dies, your opponent puts a card from their hand on top of their library. Got him. At number 135, we have Elvish Pathcutter, a 4 mana 1 2 for which you can pay 3 mana to give an elf Forest Walk. Amazing. At number 134, we have Giant Slug, a 2 mana 1 1 for which you can pay 5 mana to temporarily give it a land walk ability next turn. The creature with an expensive activated ability that grants evasion of some kind is sometimes a good finisher in limited, but Giant Slug is too small and its ability too costly. For number 133, we have Hawk Eater Moth, a rare example of a green creature with flying. The novelty wears off quickly, however, when you realize it's a 4 mana 1 2 with flying. Oh, and Shroud for what that's worth. At number 132, we have Keldon Battle Wagon. This is a 5 mana 0 3 with Trample that can't block, and when it attacks, you sacrifice it post combat. Finally, it has Tap and Untapped Creature you control, it gets plus X power equal to the tapped creature's power. If you're looking for this kind of effect at around 5 mana, you're better off playing literally any overrun effect. At 131 is Mindless Null, a 3 mana 2 2 that can't block unless you control a vampire, which usually means it just can't block. Grey Ogre style 3 mana 2 2s are already bad, so I don't know why Wizards thought this needed an additional drawback. Continuing the trend of 4 mana creatures with only 1 power, at number 130 we have Numai Outcast, a 4 mana 1 1 with Bushido 2. You can also regenerate it by paying a black mana and 5 life. At number 129 we have Quagmire Lamprey, a 3 mana 1 1 that puts a minus 1 counter on anything that blocks it. Since it's only a 1 1, it'll most certainly die in combat, but hey, at least you get that minus 1 counter. Note that the minus 1 counter is only for creatures blocking Lamprey and don't get placed if Lamprey blocks, meaning it can't even play defense. At 128 we have Takino's Cavalry, a 4 mana 1 1 with Bushido 1 that can tap to deal 1 damage to a spirit in combat. Don't think there's much to say about that. At 127 we have Viashino Skeleton. My god, a 4 mana creature with 2 power? Don't get too excited though, it only has 1 toughness. But you can pay 2 mana and discard a card to regenerate it, so that's... something. Before moving on, note that at least these cards have the benefit of being creatures that can attack or block. Moving forward, many cards will not even have that going for them. High cost, low payoff. Our next batch of cards have high costs, either literally expensive mana costs, or lots of hoops to jump through with minimal payoff. The effects aren't worth the cost you pay for them, or maybe any cost at all. Perhaps the best representation of this is our number 126 card, Aladdin's Lamp. For a whopping 10 mana investment, you'd expect to get something pretty good out of it. So what does the lamp do? It has X and tap, the next time you draw a card, instead look at the top X cards, put all but one on the bottom, and then draw. Is filtering your draw good? Yes. Is paying 10 mana plus X worth it though? At number 125 and 124, we have Acceptable Losses and Waste Away. These are expensive 4 and 5 mana single target removal spells that have an additional cost of discarding a card. 2 for 1s are good because of card advantage. These spells are built in 1 for 2s, which is the opposite. At number 123 we have Assembly Hall. As an aside, expect a lot of trash bin worthy artifacts from Magic's early days on this list. Assembly Hall costs 5 mana, then another 4 to tap it to reveal a creature in your hand and tutor a copy of it. I suppose how good this effect is depends on the creature, but generally it's not too desirable to find copies of things you already have. Add in a total cost of 9 mana between casting and activating Assembly Hall, and this is a major dud of a card. At number 122 we have Collapsing Borders, a 4 mana red enchantment for which, at the beginning of each player's upkeep, that player gains 1 life per basic land type among lands they control. Then Collapsing Borders bolts them. So to start with, you have to be playing a domain deck yourself to not lose to the life loss. At best, you're gaining 2 life per turn. 
On the opponent's side, two color decks are common enough, if not more colors, so how much damage this deals is variable. Even if you sideboard it against basic land typeless decks, you're still paying 4 mana to deal 3 per turn, which isn't terrible, but it's worse than other things you could be doing. At number 121, we have Coma Veil, a 5 mana blue aura that enchants an artifact or creature to prevent it untapping. Removal that doesn't actually get permanents off the board are already dubious. Then throw in that this is 5 mana, sorcery speed, and it doesn't even tap the permanent when it enters. At number 120, we have Delif's Cube, a 1 mana artifact with pay 2 mana and tap it. If target creature you control attacks and isn't blocked, it deals no damage and instead put a cube counter on Delif's Cube. You can then pay 2 mana and remove a cube counter to regenerate target creature. Attacking unblocked can already be a difficult hoop to jump through, then add on that the payoff is paying a total of 5 mana to regenerate one creature one time. At 119, we have Earthlink, a 6 mana Jund enchantment that also has an upkeep cost of 2 mana. It says, whenever a creature dies, its controller sacrifices a land. So for an upfront cost of 6 mana and recurring 2 mana payments, you can make it so that destroying your opponent's creatures also yields incremental mana denial. Quite a good effect by the time you can resolve a 6 mana enchantment, wouldn't you say? Also note that Earthlink's effect is symmetrical, so it also applies when your creatures die. At number 118, we have Forethought Amulet, a 5 mana artifact that reduces the damage from burn spells to you, that's you only, not your creatures, from 3 or more to 2. It also requires a recurring upkeep payment of 3 mana. At 117, we have Hornet Cannon, a 4 mana artifact where you pay 3 mana and tap it to make a 1 1 flyer with haste that dies at end of turn. I don't know about you, but I'm not interested in paying 7 mana for a 1 1. At 116, we have Jandor's Ring, a 6 mana artifact with 2 mana and tap, discard a card you just drew, and draw another card. So, 8 mana to rummage. Continuing the high cost artifacts, at 115, we have Hoven's Tools, a 6 mana artifact with 4 mana, tap, Target creature can't be blocked except by walls until end of turn. 10 mana to make a creature mostly unblockable is simply too much. At number 114 we have Kamal's Sledge, a 7 mana red sorcery that deals 4 damage to target creature. Additionally, if you have Threshold, it deals 4 damage to the creature's controller. So if you ever thought that Searing Blaze would be improved by adding 1 more damage at the cost of 5 more mana, Sledge is here to provide. At 113, we have Life Matrix, a 4 mana artifact that requires another 4 mana to tap and only during your upkeep to put a regeneration counter on a creature. Soak that in for a bit. At 112, we have Martyr's Tomb, a 4 mana white and black enchantment where you can pay 2 life to prevent 1 damage to a creature. I suppose it sort of safeguards your creatures against burn and combat damage, but realistically, how many times can you activate Martyr's Tomb before the life payments become unaffordable? At 111, we have Phyrexian Portal, a 3 mana artifact with the following ability. Pay 3 mana, target opponent looks at the top 10 cards of your library and separates them into two face down piles. You exile one of the piles, then search the remaining pile for a card and put it into your hand. Activate only if your library has more than 10 cards. This is sort of factor fiction esque, but there are significant downsides. It costs a total of 6 mana between casting and activating it, and your opponent gets to pick the piles without you knowing what's in them. Essentially, this is 6 mana to draw the best card from a randomized set of the top 10 cards. You do get to potentially activate it more than once, but that'll run out quickly. At number 110 we have Rune Sword. There's a lot of text here, but basically you just need to know that this is 9 mana to give an attacker plus 2 power. At 109 we have Serpent Generator, a 6 mana artifact where you pay 4 and tap it to create a 1-1 snake token with poison 1. I don't know about you, but personally I'm not keen on spending 10 mana to make a 1-1. At number 108 we have Triassic Egg, a 4 mana artifact where you can pay 3 mana and tap it to put a hatchling counter on it. It has, remove 2 hatchling counters and sacrifice it, you may put a creature card from your hand or graveyard onto the battlefield. Cheating creatures into play is good. Spending 10 mana over 2-3 to three turns to do so, not so much. At number 107 we have Wand of Ith, a 4 mana artifact where you can pay 3 mana and tap it to do the following. Look at a random card from a player's hand. If it's not a land, they choose to either discard it or pay life equal to its cost. If it is a land, they discard it or pay 1 life. Activate Wand of Ith only during your turn. So basically, you're paying 7 mana to look at a random card in your opponent's hand, at which point they either discard it, unlikely, or pay a variable amount of life, as low as 1 if it's a land. Yeah, no thanks. So bad you pay it twice. This next set of cards are also high cost, low payoff, but they have the additional tax of requiring you to keep paying for them in some way. At number 106 we have Cycle of Life, a 3 mana green enchantment that has, bounce itself, 
Target creature you cast this turn is a 0-1 until your next upkeep, at which point it gets a plus 1 counter. So for 3 mana, you're actually harming your own board position by making one of your creatures a 0-1, it's restrictive since you can only activate it during your own turn, and all for the grand payoff of a single plus 1 counter. And if you want to do this again for some reason, you'll have to pay another 3 mana since Cycle of Life bounces itself. At number 105, we have a relatively newer card, Cyclopean Snare. This is a 2 mana artifact which costs 3 mana and tap to activate. Tap target creature, then bounce Snare. Tapping a creature isn't that great of an effect to begin with, and adding 5 mana every time you want to didn't help. At number 104, we have Razor Boomerang. This is a 3 mana equipment that equips for 2 and has Equipped Creature has Tap, Unattached Razor Boomerang, Boomerang deals 1 damage to any target, then bounce Boomerang. Trying to make a top-down design for a boomerang may have been cute, but it resulted in this nigh-unplayable card. At least dealing one damage is a bit more useful than what Cyclopean Snare does. At number 103, we have Sandstone Deadfall, a 3-mana artifact that destroys an attacking creature. At the cost of sacrificing itself and two lands, the total cost here is completely absurd for what you get out of it. At number 102, we have Suprazen Raider, a 3-mana 1-2 that bounces itself when it's blocked, so if attacking with a 1-power creature was somehow going to be useful, your opponent can just negate the damage by blocking with literally anything. At number 101, we have Warping Worm, a 4-mana blue and green 1-1 one -one creature with phasing. If you don't pay its 4-mana cost on upkeep, it phases out. When it phases in, it gets a plus 1 counter. So this is the sequence that happens with Warping Worm. You cast it. You now have a 1-1. One -one. Next turn it phases out. You now don't have a 1-1. One -one. Next turn it phases in and gets a plus 1 counter. If you don't pay 4 mana immediately, it'll phase out again. So best case scenario, you're paying 8 mana for a 2-2. Two -two. Or alternatively, you can let it keep phasing in and out over and over over the course of many turns until it's eventually large enough that paying 4 mana on upkeep is worth it. How many times it has to phase for that to be the case, I'll let you decide. And at number 100, we have Zephyr Spirit, a 6 mana 0 6 that bounces when it blocks. So it can't attack, and if you block with it, you have to pay another 6 mana to recast it. Self negating cards. Our next batch of cards would maybe be useful, but they have abilities which render their effects irrelevant. At number 99, we have Aether Storm, a 4 mana blue enchantment that makes it so that creatures can't be cast. Well, that seems like a pretty good effect. What's the downside? Pay 4 life, destroy Aether Storm, any player may activate this ability. Oh. At number 98 we have Armageddon Clock. Clock costs 6 mana to do the following. On upkeep, put a doom counter on it. On draw step, clock deals damage to each player equal to the doom counters. Yes, that's each player. Finally, any player can pay 4 mana during any upkeep to remove a counter from it. So, if the worst sulfuric vortex you've ever seen could have had any potential to be good, your opponent can just pay to remove the counters. At number 97, we have Essence Vortex, a 3 mana blue and black instant that destroys target creature, unless its controller pays life equal to its toughness. At number 96, we have Mersane. Mersane is a 4 mana blue aura that enters with 3 net counters and enchants a creature. The enchanted creature doesn't untap as long as there are net counters, but its controller can pay the creature's cost to remove a net counter. Like Coma Veil, this is an expensive blue anti-untap aura that doesn't actually tap the creature when it enters. However, it's even worse than Coma Veil because the creature's controller can eventually pay their way out of it. At number 95 we have Power Leak, a 2 mana blue aura that enchants an enchantment. On the upkeep of the enchantment's controller, Power Leak deals 2 damage to them, but they can pay 1 mana per damage to prevent that damage. So this needs an enchantment to enchant in the first place, and then the opponent can just pay to ignore the effect. At number 94 we have Vectus Dominator, a 3 mana white and black 0-2 creature with tap, tap target creature unless its controller pays 2 life. So, a creature tapper except the opponent can just ignore the ability most of the time. At number 93 we have Tidal Flats, a 1 mana blue enchantment with an ability that costs double blue. All your creatures that are blocking any non-flyers gain first strike, but the attacking player can pay 1 mana for each creature to prevent it from gaining first strike. So, this is essentially an onboard combat trick, which means it's not a trick, which your opponent can pay a minimal amount to ignore. And speaking of combat tricks, next up are combat tricks, with 16 quotation marks around that because the opponent sees them coming. At number 92 we have Acidic Dagger, a 4 mana artifact where you pay another 4 mana and tap to destroy any non-wall creature receiving combat damage from target creature this turn. If the creature leaves play, bury Acidic Dagger, and activate this ability only before blockers are chosen. So, 8 mana for Death Touch, you lose the dagger if your creature dies, and you have to activate it before they declare blockers. 
At number 91, we have Barreling Attack, a 4 mana red instant. Target creature gains trample and plus 1 for each creature that blocks it. The way this is worded, you have to cast it before blockers are declared to get the pump, which defeats its use as a combat trick. At number 90, we have Rapid Fire, a 4 mana white instant. Cast it before blockers are declared, target creature gains first strike and rampage 2. Once again, the fact that you have to cast it before blockers are chosen defeats the surprise factor. Narrow Cards our next set of cards could have had a use, but their effects are so narrow that they're actually useless for most practical purposes. At numbers 89, 88, and 87, we have Anti-Set-Specific Destruction Artifacts, Apocalypse Chime, City in a Bottle, and Golgothian Silex. These are artifacts that eliminate cards from a specific set only. In Chime's case, it's 4 mana and sacrifice to get rid of all permanents from Homelands. Homelands is considered to be one of, if not the, lowest powered set in the entire game. City in a Bottle is similar, getting rid of permanents and preventing anyone from playing cards from Arabian Nights. The only relevant ones being City of Brass, Drop of Honey, which is sometimes sideboarded in Legacy Lands, and Bazaar of Baghdad and Vintage. At number 86, we have Baki's Curse, a 4 mana blue sorcery that shocks every creature for each aura attached to it. For Baki's Curse to be useful, your opponent probably needs to have multiple creatures with auras on them that'll die from the damage. At number 85, we have Cephalid Snitch, a 2 mana blue 1 1 creature that can be sacrificed to make a creature lose protection from black. I think this speaks for itself. At number 84, we have Hint of Insanity, a 3 mana black sorcery where target player reveals their hand and discards all non-lands with this same name as another card in their hand. Hand disruption needs to actually disrupt. There's no guarantee the opponent will even have two copies of the same card in hand. At number 83, we have Parallax Inhibitor, a 2 mana artifact that can pay 1 mana, tap, and sacrifice to put a fade counter on each permanent with fading. There aren't that many cards with fading to begin with, much less good ones, and adding just one more counter isn't great either. At number 82, we have Shelkin Brownie, a 2 mana green 1 1 creature that can tap to remove the Bands with Other ability from target creature. FYI, the Bands with Other ability only appears on 8 cards in the entire game, one of which is Shelkin Brownie, and another is Talaria that also just removes the ability. In order to understand how terrifyingly powerful banding is that it would warrant this kind of targeted hate, Here's the comprehensive rules text for banding. At number 81, we have Tomb Fire, a 1 mana black sorcery that exiles all cards with flashback from a graveyard. Unless flashback spells suddenly become extremely powerful, Tomb Fire doesn't have much use. There's also the inherent problem that spells with flashback in the graveyard probably got there in the first place because they were cast once already and therefore the player already got value out of them. At numbers 80 through 70, we have the Kool-Aid Men, or wall cards like Tunnel, Tower of Coriol, and the Glyph Cycle. While there are many different walls, 147 in fact, cards like these that have such a specific focus are just too narrow to be of any practical use. Random Cards Next are cards where their effects are too random to be reliable, if they were even good in the first place. At number 69, we have Aether Rift, a 3 mana red and green enchantment. On upkeep, discard a random card. If you discard a creature, put it onto the battlefield unless any player pays 5 life. Cheating creatures into play for only 3 mana is good, but Aether Rift is too random. You either have to somehow control which cards are in your hand so you're left with only creatures you want to cheat into discarding, or hope to get lucky. Then, even if you discard a creature, your opponent can just pay 5 life to negate the effect. At number 68, we have Friendly Fire, a 4 mana red instant that says, Target creature's controller reveals a random card from their hand. Friendly Fire deals damage to the creature and player equal to the revealed card's mana value. You have no guarantee that the revealed card will have a mana value equal to or higher than the creature's toughness, making Friendly Fire unreliable as removal. Additionally, if the opponent is empty-handed, it does nothing. At number 67, we have Goblin Psychopath, a 4 mana 5 5 which may initially appear acceptable until you read it. Whenever Goblin Psychopath attacks or blocks, flip a coin. If you lose the flip, the next time it would deal combat damage this turn, it deals that much damage to you instead. Similarly, at number 66, we have Goblin Test Pilot, a 3 mana blue and red 0 2 creature with flying. It has tap, deal 2 damage to a random target. That includes itself, by the way. At number 65, we have Wireflyer Hive, a 3 mana artifact that taps for 3 to create a 2 2 flying token. Well, that's if you win the coin flip. If you lose it, it destroys all the tokens you've made thus far. So, best case scenario, it's 6 mana to make a 2 2 flyer. If you try to make any more, you run the risk of undoing all the resources you spent up to that point. 
There's also the chance that your initial investment of 6 mana results in nothing happening. And at numbers 64 through 54, we have the various other flip a coin cards. These are cards where you flip a coin and either get a benefit or actually hurt yourself. Examples are cards like Bottle of Suleiman, Crooked Scales, Game of Chaos, Fighting Chance, Desperate Gambit, Goblin Bang Chuckers, Goblin Bomb, Goblin Liar, Impulsive Maneuvers, Risky Move, and Tide of War. Unlike the other flip a coin cards where there may only be positive effects but they're random, or losing the flip merely whiffs but you can try again, these cards are all potentially very detrimental. Whatever their positive effects, they all have very bad downsides, and at 50-50 odds, none of them are worth casting, especially the more expensive ones. Useless cards. Next are cards that are essentially useless, either because they have too many drawbacks or hoops to jump through, or because their effects are so bad that they basically don't do anything. Starting off strong at number 53, we have Celestial Prism, a 3 mana artifact that pays 2 mana and taps to filter 1 mana into a different color. Even setting aside the initial investment of 3 mana, you're still going down a mana to filter 1 color. At number 52, we have Cocoon, a 1 mana green enchant creature aura that enters with 3 pupa counters. The enchanted creature doesn't untap if Cocoon has a pupa counter on it. And on upkeep, remove a pupa counter. When the last is removed, you sack the cocoon and put a plus one counter on the enchanted creature and it gains flying permanently. So if you're willing to take three turns off attacking since your creature won't untap, you can get the glorious payoff of a plus one counter and flying. At number 51, we have Common Cause, a three mana white enchantment that says non-artifact creatures get plus two plus two as long as they all share a color. So what's so bad about that, you may say? It's a double anthem for decks with same color creatures. Well, read it again. The effect is symmetrical. No, I don't just mean that your opponent's creatures also get pumped. All the creatures in play have to share a color. If your opponent controls even one creature that doesn't have an overlapping color, none of the creatures on the battlefield get the bonus. At number 50, we have Crazed Goblin, a 1 mana 1 1 that has to attack. Now, not only is 1 mana for a 1 1 already bad, forced attacking is one of the worst downsides a creature can have, especially if it's weak. At number 49, we have Defensive Stance, a 1 mana blue aura that gives enchanted creature minus 1 power and plus 1 toughness. So, either an opponent's attacker is marginally weaker, or one of your blockers is marginally tougher. At number 48, we have Ignoble Soldier, a 3 mana 3 1 white creature. Whenever it's blocked, prevent all combat damage it would deal. So, if your opponent has literally any blocker, Ignoble Soldier can't attack profitably. At least it can trade on defense. At number 47, we have Pretender's Claim, a 2 mana black aura that enchants a creature and makes it so that if it's blocked, you tap all lands the defender controls. So basically, enchanted creature can't be blocked unless your opponent really wants to block it, or they were tapped out anyway, or they don't have something to spend their mana on at instant speed. So it basically does nothing. Detrimental cards. This is the last section before we get to the worst of the worst. Unlike the previous entries, which were simply overcosted or underperformed, these cards are actively detrimental and are liable to actually set you back by using them. First up at number 46, we have Alabaster Leech, a one mana white creature that causes your white spells to cost one more white. Yikes, it taxes your own spells. Well, it's gotta have pretty impressive stats to make up for that, right? Wanna guess how big it is? I'll give you a moment. It's a 1-3. At number 45, we have Bargain, a 3 mana white sorcery that draws your opponent a card. But that's okay because in exchange you gain 7 life. At number 44, we have Game Preserve, a 3 mana green enchantment that says, on upkeep, each player reveals their top card. If all of them are creatures, put them onto the battlefield under their owner's control. So first off, this suffers from variance since if any of the revealed cards aren't creatures, nothing happens. Secondly, while cheating creatures onto the battlefield is good, cheating your opponent's creatures isn't. At numbers 43 and 42, we have Goblin Firebug and Exiled Bogart, bears that make you sacrifice a land or discard a card when they die. They may as well say pay 2 mana to go down a card. At number 41, continuing the Goblin trend, we have Mog Squad, a 2 mana 3 3 that gets minus 1 minus 1 for each other creature on the battlefield. So even if you play no other creatures yourself, if your opponent controls 3 creatures, this just dies. And at number 40, we have Tongarth's Glare, a 1 mana red sorcery that says look at the top three cards of an opponent's library and rearrange them. Then, they look at your top three cards and rearrange them. Worst of the worst. This last stretch of cards is for those that, while they could have been filed under the previous categories, are so terrible I thought they deserved their own section. And it should tell you something that this is the bottom 40 or so cards. At number 39, we have Fasting, a one mana white enchantment that lets you skip your draw step to gain two life. Additionally, if you would draw a card for any reason, you sacrifice Fasting. 
Additionally, you put a hunger counter on fasting during your upkeep, and when it hits 5 counters, you sacrifice it anyway. Gaining life is notoriously one of the least impactful effects in the game. Conversely, drawing cards is the best one, maybe tied with cheating on mana. So why not sacrifice drawing cards to gain life? In the same vein, at number 38, we have Juju Bubble, a 1 mana artifact where you can pay 2 mana to gain 1 life. It has cumulative upkeep 1, and if you play any card while Juju Bubble is out, including lands, it goes away. The ability is expensive for what little benefit you get from it, you can't play anything else without losing it, and the cumulative upkeep cost also taxes your ability to keep it around or use it. At number 37, we have North Star, a 4 mana artifact with a 4 mana activated ability. Tap for 1 spell this turn, you may spend mana as though it were mana of any type to pay its mana cost, although additional costs are still paid normally. If you thought Celestial Prism was bad for mana fixing, North Star costs more than twice as much. At number 36, we have Security Detail, a 4 mana white enchantment with a double white activated ability that creates a 1 1 creature token. However, you can only activate it if you control 0 creatures and only once per turn. So, baseline, this is 6 mana for a 1 1, and you can't make more 1 1s until the first one dies. At number 35, we have Arkham Slay, a 1 mana artifact where you pay 2 mana and tap it to give an attacking creature vigilance. Okay, weak enough. However, you can only activate it if the defending player controls a snow land. 3 mana for Vigilance on one creature is already bad enough, but the Extreme Restriction pretty much kills this card since most decks don't even run Snowlands. At number 34, we have Divine Intervention, an 8 mana white enchantment that enters with two intervention counters on it. On upkeep, remove a counter, and then, if there are no counters on it, the game ends in a draw. That's right, not you win the game, the game is a draw. I don't know why you would want to spend 8 mana and wait 3 turns to draw the game, but here you go. At number 33 we have Erosion, a 3 mana blue enchant land that costs triple blue. On upkeep of the land's controller, it's destroyed unless they pay 1 mana or 1 life. So kind of a Stone Rain-esque effect in blue, except they can just tap the land it's attached to to pay for it, or pay life to ignore Erosion entirely. At numbers 32 through 28 we have the Lace Cycle, Chaos Lace, Death Lace, Life Lace, Pure Lace, and Thought Lace. These are 1 mana instants that change the color of a spell or permanent to whatever color the lace is. I don't know why that would be useful. By the way, these cards were printed without set symbols, but I can confirm they're all rares, meaning you could open any of these as your booster pack rare at the time. Similarly, and even more expensively, at number 27 there's Alcor's Tomb, a 4 mana artifact plus 2 additional mana to tap to change the color of one of your permanents. At number 26 we have Merchant Ship, a 1 mana blue 0-2 creature that, when it attacks and isn't blocked, you gain 2 life, although I doubt it would be hard to block with those stats. Also, it can't attack unless your opponent controls an island. Also, it dies if you don't control an island. At number 25 we have Rackalite, a 6 mana artifact where you can pay 2 mana to prevent 1 damage to a creature or player. However, it then bounces back to your hand at the end step. This is probably the worst version of the multi-payment cards that self-bounce or have recurring upkeep costs. At number 24, and get ready because this one's a doozy, we have Wood Elemental, a 4 mana green creature with variable power and toughness. As it enters the battlefield, you sacrifice any number of untapped forests. Its power and toughness are equal to the number of sacrificed forests. First off, the sacrificed lands have to be forests, they can't be anything else. Second, the fact that the forests have to be untapped means you can't use them to pay for anything, including wood elemental. Third, how many forests would you need to sacrifice for its stats to be worth 4 mana? Fourth, sacrificing lands is terrible. And fifth, wood elemental doesn't even have any other useful abilities like trample or shroud. At numbers 23 through 19, we have the cycle of anti-landwalk enchantments from Legends. Crevasse, Deadfall, Great Wall, Quagmire, and Undertow. Each of these are 3 mana monocolor enchantments that allow creatures with the associated landwalk ability to be blocked as though they didn't have it. So for example, Deadfall allows creatures with forest walk to be blocked normally. Landwalk is already not some amazing ability and these enchantments don't even eliminate those creatures but rather just let you block them. Not content with how bad these are, at numbers 18 through 17 we have the opposite effects on Asen Highway and Hidden Path. 6 mana, color intensive enchantments that grant a specific type of landwalk to all creatures. 
That's all creatures, by the way, meaning your opponent's creatures also gain landwalk of the color you're playing. At numbers 16 through 12, we have the cycle of banding lands from Legends, Adventurer's Guild House, Cathedral of Sarah, Mountain Stronghold, Seafarer's Quay, and Unholy Citadel. To take one as an example, Cathedral of Sarah is a land, that doesn't tap for mana by the way, that grants your white legendary creatures the ability to bands with other legends. The other lands have the same ability, just swapping the color of legends they're granting banding to. Needless to say, at number 11, we have Fatal Mutation, a one mana black aura that enchants and destroys a face down creature when it's turned face up. There aren't that many morph creatures to begin with, and many of them have triggers when they're turned face up. Plus, your opponent can just choose not to flip them. If you're really in the market for destroying face down creatures, you can just cast Fatal Push or something. At number 10, we have Brutal Suppression, a one mana red enchantment that makes activated abilities of rebels cost an additional sacrifice a land to activate. Rebels are an old tribe mostly known for their activated abilities. However, there are only 19 rebels with activated abilities in the game and they're not even very good. On top of that, tacking sack a land onto them isn't that great either since they can just pay the cost if they really want to. At number 9, we have Mud Hole, a 3 mana red instant that exiles all lands from a graveyard. Yes, lands. Not creatures, not artifacts, not instants and sorceries, not anything players typically recur for value. Lands. If you really want to stop life from the loam, there are better ways to do it. And it's also baffling that this is a rare. At number 8, we have Nine Ringed Bow, a 3 mana artifact that can tap to deal 1 damage to a spirit and exile it if it would die. And unlike Takino's Cavalry, this is an artifact, not even a creature that can attack or block. At number 7, we have Root Cage, a 2 mana green enchantment that makes mercenaries not untapped during the untap step. Unlike Brutal Suppression and its effects on rebels, the mercenary tribe has more creatures in it at 43, but they're all bad. At number 6, we have Snowfall, a 3 mana blue enchantment with cumulative upkeep blue. Islands produce an additional blue, and snow covered islands produce 2 additional blue but this mana can only be spent on cumulative upkeep costs. Outside of Mystic Remora, the cards with cumulative upkeep are all bad, and since Snowfall has cumulative upkeep itself, you're more liable to spend the mana it provides on itself rather than anything else. At number 5, we have Trap Finder's Trick, a 2 mana blue sorcery that says, target player reveals their hand and discards all trap cards. First off, I have no idea why this discard spell is blue instead of black. Secondly, there are only 20 traps in the game, and while some of them are good, this is still way too narrow of an effect for Trap Finder's Trick to be useful. At number 4, we have Task Mage Assembly, a 3 mana red enchantment that must be sacrificed when there are no creatures on the battlefield. For 2 mana, it deals 1 damage to target creature. Oh, and any player can activate it. And it's sorcery speed. At number 3 we have Break Open, a 2 mana red instant that turns target face down creature and opponent controls face up. Unlike Fatal Mutation, which at least hypothetically kills a morph creature, Break Open actively works against you by turning your opponent's face down creature face up for them. At number 2 we have Ristic Cave. With cards like Rashadon Port and Wasteland, it's clear that mana denial is a valuable angle of attack, but what if you could let your opponents deny you mana yourself? That's where Ristic Cave comes in. It has tap, add one mana of any color, unless any player pays one mana. Essentially, Ristic Cave lets your opponent deny you mana from it as long as they keep one land untapped. And last but not least, at number one, we have the absolute worst, most useless, most self-flagellating card of all time, Sorrow's Path. This land, which doesn't tap for mana, has the following ability. Tap, choose two target blocking creatures an opponent controls. If each of them could block all creatures the other is blocking, remove both from combat. Each one then blocks all the creatures the other was blocking. That may sound convoluted enough, but the last ability is the final nail in the coffin. Whenever Sorrow's Path becomes tapped, it deals 2 damage to you and each creature you control. The scenarios where you want to switch blockers around are already incredibly rare. Then, your creatures have to survive the 2 damage pyroclasm Sorrow's Path deals them, and it shocks you. That concludes the video, and I hope you've enjoyed it. Did I miss any cards you think should have been included? Leave your thoughts in the comments. Thank you to my supporters, and if you enjoy these videos, consider subscribing or supporting the channel on Patreon. And take care.